China, the sleeping giant that awakens. A country of 1.4 billion people, of sprawling cities, of a massive economy, the most extensive road network in the world, and the world's largest car industry. Welcome everyone to episode 39 of the Automotive History series. And in this three-part episode, it's about the history of the Chinese car industry. An auto industry too big to ignore. And this is part two, the copycat car era. Compared to other nations, the Chinese car industry wasn't off to a great start. During almost the entire 20th century, China was plagued with one war after another, mixed up with some revolutions here and there for good measure. There was almost no focus on car production. The people were not granted car ownership except for the great leaders and the elite. By the late 1980s, car production was still at an all-time low, but the demand for the cars was outrageous. China faces a great challenge. It wants to make cars, but needs help from the outside to develop them. But at the same time, China also doesn't want to be flooded by foreign car brands. Is there any solution? Joint Ventures. A joint venture is where two parties decide to cooperate, but both will retain their identity. Foreign car companies will not overrule the local market, foreign companies will not rival the domestic car makers, foreign companies will do as directed by the nation's government. Now, say about the forced nature all you want, but it's somewhat beneficial both ways. Chinese car makers get the help from more experienced foreign car makers, and those foreign car makers get to sell cars and make money anyway, especially in China, until then a huge, if not the largest, untapped market. China's most premier car brands found partnerships with Western world car makers during a time when car ownership among the Chinese was still at an all-time low. In 1985, there was about one car for every six million Chinese. Among one of the first partnerships that was established was that of the German Volkswagen and the Chinese Shanghai Tractor Automobile Corporation, now known as SAYC, or SIAC as I like to call it, which as of today is the largest Chinese car maker. After a little test trial, SIAC and Volkswagen released the Volkswagen Santana sedan in 1984 to the Chinese people. This is arguably the first large-scale, mass-produced, Chinese-made vehicle. The car became an instant hit that truly put China on wheels, the Chinese counterpart of that other Volkswagen car, the Beetle. After two years, already some 10,000 Santanas were sold, and that is double of the annual output production of the entire Chinese industry a couple years prior. The Santana started out only as a sedan, but was quickly joined by a wagon version a couple years later, and became a popular vehicle of choice by police and other government agencies, as well as taxi companies. And although the car received some technical and styling updates throughout the years, what in essence is the Santana remained in production all the way until 2013. By then, some 3.2 million Santanas were made. What helped greatly and what could be considered as the final nail in the coffin of the planned economy is the reforms and opening up program, which opened the gates more and more to the international market. From here on out, more foreign car makers made deals with Chinese brands and Western car companies started to roll into the country through joint ventures. Around the same time, the Chinese government regarded an auto industry as a pillar industry and came up with a plan to rapidly establish large-scale production. Starting in 1994, the industry had three years to lay the foundations, three years to overcome difficulties and streamline production, and another ten years of the new millennium to rapidly develop and massively expand the industry. During the 1990s, the car industry was a booming business, and this is the period many new Chinese car companies were established. Seriously, many car companies are not even all that old. The government wanted two or three large-scale brands and then some six or seven smaller backbone automobile companies. Brilliance was founded in 1992, 
Great Wall Motors in 1993, Photon in 1996, Cherry in 1997, and Geely in 2002, alongside the already existing Dongfeng, Sayak, and Bayek, and this is only the top of the iceberg. By the start of the 2000s, this process was further accelerated by China joining the World Trade Organization. The Chinese people became richer and richer and could afford luxury goods and experiences like owning a car and seeing the world. There was a massive appetite for anything coming from the West. And this leads to some peculiar things. The Chinese love the magic of the old Western world and want a piece of the action in their own country, but at an affordable price. This led to the rise of the knockoff imitations and copycat designs of virtually everything. Think computers, think fashion, think fast food chains, and even entire cities are designed to look almost exactly like the Western original counterpart. And of course, also cars. After 50 years of making cars, the Chinese can't seem to shake off the old ways of doing it. Some of the cars may do feature a fairly unique design, sometimes, but around this time plenty of cars were a blatant copy of Western cars. It seems like the practice of reverse engineering hasn't died off, meaning getting your hands on a Western car, deconstruct it, replicate the parts and only change one or two design gimmicks and reconstruct it and voila. Let's have a look at some of these knockoff cars because that's the only reason you clicked on this video. Imagine being a moderately rich Chinese businessman with no political ties who can get a honky for some reason, but also cannot afford a British Rolls Royce either because of outrageous import tariffs. The Chinese car company Geely has got you covered with their GE, a luxury car heavily inspired by Rolls Royce. The car is for you and you only, with only one chair as the back seat. A proper chair for a proper Chinese chairman. In the meantime, China had caught up with the Western retro craze that was going on. Fiat, Volkswagen and others came up with retro rides. BMW launched the new Mini brand and reintroduced Mini as a trendy city car. But wait, why get the real deal when Lifan or Lifan can provide you with the almost exact same thing? The Lifan 320 is the right car for you. This was the first effort of making a car by a company that only used to make motorcycles. But what if you live up in the mountains? You need a sturdy and rugged SUV. Over in China you could get the Shuangwang SCEO, the Chinese BMW X5, or a Landwind X7, the Chinese Range Rover Evoque, or the Zodje SR9, the Chinese Porsche Macan, and the Fa Besturn X40, the Chinese Mazda CX-5. And if you're a city dweller, tiny compact cars are also popular in China, like the Waikirui V7, a 101 copy of the small Volkswagen Up, or the best of all, the Cherry QQ Mi, a fever dream version of the Chevrolet Matisse, and I'm surprised that it didn't also receive a copyright claim from Villeroy and Boch, the toilet maker. And the list goes on. So why do the Chinese car makers, or the Chinese in general, like to copy or steal so much from the West? There is no easy answer to this, and it has more than one reason. First, through decades and decades of forced collectivism and the idea of us instead of me, there is not a lot of individualism. It's a cultural thing to not come up with anything unique, but instead look over someone else's shoulder. A second reason is that the Chinese are very good at manufacturing, but not necessarily so much in inventing, say for the compass and fireworks. Why would you design your own stuff when you have the manpower to blatantly copy the design someone else put time, money and effort in? It saves costs on research and development. A third reason is that the import tariff on Western cars is still fairly high, making them expensive. So why wouldn't you settle for something that looks close enough like the original, but for a fraction of the price? A final reason is that China's culture doesn't give a crap about brand heritage, or trademarks, or intellectual property. 
There are not a lot of strict copyright laws, and even if there are, how would you prove that your design is unique? It's just a composition of lines, creases and curves. The Chinese knockoffs look much like your design, but they're not exactly the same and therefore unique. The Chinese knockoffs are inspired by and not a copy of. In fact, there have been legal battles over this. Western car companies would shoe Chinese brands that made these knockoffs, but of course the Chinese government-backed courtroom would favor the nation's brands and say, we have no clue what you're on about, any resemblance between your car and our car is purely a coincidence. And that brings us to the following thing, um, all come together now, that's right, you can sit over there, come on, say it with me now. Imitation is a form of flattery. flattery. And get this, there is even a website out there that keeps track of all the suing and legal battles taking place between Western car companies and Chinese car companies. It's absolutely hilarious. And it gets even crazier, trust me. There are Chinese car companies that would shoe Western car companies for copyright infringement. For instance, the Chinese car brand Yima shooed the American Ford Motor Company because of the Mustang name. The Chinese word for Mustang is Yima, and Yima already registered this name in 1986, 20 years after the initial release of the Mustang. So this was a lost case right from the start, right? Wrong. Ford only introduced the Mustang in China in 2006, so 20 years after the founding of the Yima brand. Guess who won? I'd love to give you 5 seconds, but I think you already know the answer. That's right, Yima won the case and Ford had to pay Yima 1 million yuan, or $150,000. Although Yima does seem to conveniently forget that half of the cars looked like Subarus with Audi grills glued onto them. Anyway, we are currently around the year 2010, and despite all the knockoffs and lawsuits, the Chinese car industry is seeing an unprecedented growth. The foundations that were laid in the 90s, along with heavy stimulation from the government, resulted in an industry that grew 21% every year in the mid-2000s, and that was like a given fact. In a matter of 20 years, maybe even 10, the Chinese car industry went from next to nothing to surpassing the United States in car production in 2009 and becoming the largest in the entire world in 2010 and making a quarter of the entire world car production in 2014. At this rate, a total world dominance would be right around the corner, right? Maybe. But that's what we're going to talk about in the third and final part of this episode. Roughly the 2010s until the present day. You might not hear a lot about China these days, but oh, they're coming. And they're coming fast. <laughs>